welcome everybody. Welcome back if you joined us before for the What's Cooking with Students in Action. Um, we have an exciting guest straight from Minnesota today. Um, Pablo Tapia. Pablo, I can't hear you, love. Hi, Pablo. We may need to check your mic a second or your... Cannot hear you. Oh, there you go. Okay. I, now we I got can you. hear you. All right. So we got Pablo joining us straight from Minnesota. And I want to thank everybody. Our leadership summit started yesterday with a bang with uh, Ravi Mangla and Samantha Rini, who led us through some real interesting political education and breakout sessions. Uh, today we're doing a community building and talking politics and talking about what's happened at the epicenter of Minnesota with Pablo Tapia and Charlie Albanetti, my partner and my cooking partner and buddy over there. Uh, so I wanna give an opportunity to Charlie and to Pablo to introduce themselves and then we'll take it from there. Charlie, you wanna go first cool. and let Sure, hey everybody, uh, I'm Charlie Albanetti. I'm uh, the managing director at Citizen Action um, here in Albany, New York and um, uh, this is a, a really exciting uh, evening. We're really excited to have somebody from um, from uh, the Minneapolis area to talk to us about um, all of the events that have been happening there. And, um, uh, you know, who's on the, the front lines of this movement um, over a really great dinner. And I'll let him uh, tell us more about the, the feature dish that we're cooking tonight. Um, but uh, thanks everybody for joining us as part of the this sort of special edition of what's cooking that's um, part of our large uh, leadership summit this week at Citizen Action, where all of our members are coming together in a series of events over the course of the week. Um, if you want to know more about that and you didn't happen to realize that it was part of the Citizen Action Leadership Summit, you can go to citizenactionny.org um, and sign up for uh, the remaining events. There's lots of stuff going on for the rest of the week, and we'll talk more a little bit about that at the end of the program tonight. Um, but Pablo, take it away. Pablo, I'll just say Pablo is the executive director of the um, Assembly on Civil Rights in Minnesota. Um, and uh, he's, he's graciously joined us uh, for a great discussion tonight. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Charlie. My name is Pablo, Pablo Tapia. I'm one of the, uh, one of the leaders here in the Latino community in Minnesota. I, I lead the organization called Asamblea de Derechos Civiles. We are a, um, a faith-based organization affiliated with the uh, Gamilio Network, which is in uh, more than 20, 25 states in the whole country. And what we do best is transform our community to uh, build power to change the policies that affect our daily lives. So thank you very much for the invitation. I feel honored to be here in this uh, conversation. And I guess it pays to, uh, it pays to be a, 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 a once in a while single father because you know how to cook and it's, this is a gravy train for me. I love to, to do this. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. I'm seeing in the chat that we've got Margaret Segal out of New York City. We've got uh, Armina from Utica. Awesome, I love Utica, awesome. So thank you all for joining again. Um, I wanted to share with you actually how I know Pablo. So for a little while there, um, I was working at, I had left Citizen Action. Uh, we had one big on education at Citizen Action. And I said, what's next, what's next? And someone said, healthcare, we've got to get healthcare done right. And I said, hmm, where can I go and do that? Because the feeling of winning so big on $7 billion here in New York State was amazing. So I turned my eye and I wound up at 1199 for a little while, who sent me to Minnesota. Now, I didn't know anything about Minnesota. And I'm like, so you're sending me to Minnesota uh, to work with um, Hispanics in Minnesota? And I said, but wait a minute. So I looked up the demographics of Minnesota and I looked at Rochester, Minnesota. 
and it was like 99.9% white. And I said, so where am I gonna find these Hispanics? Under a rock? <laughs> well, that's how much I knew. When I got to Minneapolis, it was amazing. Um, the, um, the number of um, Hispanics that are there, the number of Somalis that are there, um, it was just an amazing mix. And I met Pablo doing some work. This is really interesting, guys. So they were building a throughway um, and a highway through a baseball field and through a mobile home park. And what happened there was that the Caucasian community rose up and said, no, you cannot touch our baseball park. And um, they said, okay, we'll go around the baseball park, but we're still gonna destroy the homes of all of these people who have lived here for 30 odd years or more. And when that happened, it was amazing because the community rose up under Pablo's leadership. The problem was, and I see such a connection to now, the problem was that when they rose up, they sent ICE in and the people who were loudest became deported at that time. So when I came in, they had already been deported and Lord have mercy, I tried knocking on doors in the mobile home park and nobody would answer me. The fear was palpable, like seriously, you could touch it, you could smell it, you could taste it, they just wouldn't. And Pablo got very creative, Pablo. Remember all the Indians that we, he had them with the whole headdress to come into the mobile park and we put That's peanut good. butter and jelly sandwiches together in order to feed the community and slowly coax them out of their homes so we can strategize and build. And Pablo, did you win or what? We won. <laughs> We did what? the state, the mobile home park is still standing there, you know, as as a, as one of the uh, the um, affordable housing places in that area. So we won after uh, two years. Uh, the park did not get demolished. They rerouted the road, so they went a different way, and and our community is still there, which it was mostly Latinos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Pablo, I'm, I'm, my battery may die in a second. I didn't prepare. I need to go and charge up. So I wanted you to tell us a little bit. You're living in the epicenter of Minneapolis where the George Floyd protests started. Would you mind sharing with us a little bit about what you saw and experienced there while I get this going? Well, you know, it's, it's, not, a, it's, it's not a mystery for, for many of us. The... Um, the disproportionate uh, use of power and force that the police departments use all over the country against people of color. You know, whether, you, uh, whether you're whether uh, you yellow, uh, brown or black, uh, you know you're not gonna get treated the same. You know, and, uh, and, and even, uh, even, even myself, you know, uh, happened here, I uh, remember riding with my kids, taking them to the gym. Uh, I got pulled over by, 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 by a local cop. And, and this, is, this is what happened. One of their friends that happens to be uh, white was riding with us. And, uh, and they held me there for quite a while. And then after, after a while, they let me go, checked everything. They held me that, there like for 15 minutes. And then this young white kid, you know, friend of my, friend of my, my kids, told them, you know, that he, did, he was stunned. He's, he said, I, I don't know. They never talked to my father like that. I don't know why they treated you, 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 you father like that, yelling and being very arrogant and disrespectful to him. So that was, that was an eye opening for this uh, white kid, you know, see the difference how they treat us. So it's not, a, it's not nothing new, but it, it, it just came down with the, uh, you know, with the killing of Philando Castillo that 
we just had a celebration, actually not celebration, a remembrance of, uh, of, of him, you know, being killed. And the, uh, and the movement that has not died because of that, Philando Castile, uh, that was killed in uh, St. Anthony, Minnesota, around the side of Minneapolis. And, and this uh, man that didn't do anything, and he got just shot in front of his uh, uh, girlfriend and, 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 and baby kid, you know, baby girl. Um, and then now with this, uh, I think it all accumulated. They have killed uh, other folks like, like from the Hmong community. We have a large Hmong community here in Minnesota. Uh, years ago, they killed uh, um, a person with the name Fong Lee and they planted a gun from the department. And it was so, it was awful that that way they killed him. They almost ran him over with a patrol car and they tried to uh, plant, a, uh, they planted a gun at the place. And they said that he was, uh, he was armed and that's why they had to shot him several times. So. Yeah, so Pablo, we hear these. Yeah, yeah, we hear these stories from all across the country. Yeah. What was interesting and unique to me when we were talking about this is that in Minnesota, the demographics of Minnesota, um, black, the, this movement that is currently happening is in a place where the number of African Americans in Minnesota is actually smaller, is smaller than the rest of the population. Mm -hmm. It's a small population in comparison to the population of Mexicans and, you know, so on and so forth. So yeah. it's interesting to me that it has needed the kind of like, it's gotten to its moment and it's, it's suspense um, and it's needed like, and um, I would say it's needed everyone to actually uplift Black Lives Matters. And that um, it's really interesting, the support that is outpouring. So Pablo, can you tell us a little bit about after the, you know, when the riots happened, you know, when the, everything happened in the police station, so you took a tour through your community. Can you talk to us about what you saw and the impact that that may have had on the communities there? Well, it was devastating. Right after, right after they killed uh, this cop's um, mother, um, George Floyd, people went up in arms. And, and they started demonstrating peacefully, many of them. But, uh, but some of them took, took out their own route by destroying our community, Minneapolis. But what it is, uh, what it is uh, very sad is that the the businesses that belong to the most marginalized communities, which is which is the Hmong community out in St. Paul and the Latino community and the and the African community in Minneapolis, many of those buildings uh, got burned down. They got they got looted, and uh, and it was sad. It was, there was uh, they they had a head uh, actually a count of uh, buildings that got damaged. Um, last week, and they gave us a number of uh, around 15,000 buildings that got damaged here in this area during those riots. And it, it, it was sad, but what it was most sad, you know, it was that, that later on they found out the investigations. Uh, they gave us uh, people burning buildings that were not even our neighbors. They were not even uh, uh, residents of Minnesota. Many of them came from uh, out of all the states to create that burning and all that disaster and, and provocation of looting. Mm -hmm. this, this reminds me so much of, you know, I'm from New York City, as many of you know, and there was a time period when they said the burnt down Bronx and that they blamed mm -hmm. us, particularly the Hispanic community for burning down mm -hmm. the Bronx. Mm -hmm. And we didn't burn it down, we saved it. And there's a wonderful um, documentary about that. But let's take a break and start talking about what you're cooking. Oh. So uh, Pablo, why don't you start us off? You talked about like doing something with salsa. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're cooking today? Well, 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be cooking a, uh, a what I call a salsa rallada or or grated, a grated hot sauce. I have my my ingredients right here. My, I have my my, what's it called? Uh, tomatoes. I'm not good at them. Tomatoes. Oops. There it goes. Uh, cilantro. I got onion. We gotta have onion and and just uh, uh, chile serranos. This is, is good enough, I think. Yeah. That is so awesome. That's what I'm gonna be, and not the, and this is all you need. You don't need a grinder. You don't need a blender. This is all you need. Ooh! Oh, Pablo, do not show me that. For those of you who don't know, I was a knucklehead when I was a kid, <laughs> and guayando, which is called that was my punishment for being a knucklehead as we made pasteles. And I would scrape my fingers and I'd be like, why do I have to do this? So that's almost like a torture device trauma. <laughs> oh no. Charlie, what are you cooking? Well, I was just gonna ask Pablo, do you, you, you actually use the tomato on the grater too? Yes, yes, huh. you grate huh. it too. Nice. Oh my just, goodness. Don't 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 ever expect it's gonna come out nice and in in real slices. No, just yeah, no, it's messy. Rip it apart in in several pieces, but it, it just <laughs> blends real nice of flavor. That's cool. I wish that I had um, now not actually started prepping while you were talking because I I've done my tomatoes. I did a little jalapeno. I did red onion, very fine, and. Um, uh, I still have to do the cilantro and, oh, I threw in some red red bell pepper also in addition to the jalapeno. And um, I was gonna mix up a little bit of spices and um, seasonings and maybe just throw in a touch of vinegar for some extra kick. And, um, and then in addition to the salsa, I was gonna make a, like a slaw with some Napa cabbage and, um, and Greek yogurt. And then it's all gonna go on top of fish tacos. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's um, what am I making? I am making a taco dip. And so basically what I've done is I've gathered cream cheese and sour cream and some taco seasoning and mixed it all up and did that really good. Some hamburger meat. Um, rather than black beans, because I have a little one at home who's probably going to pick through all the black beans, I used uh, black olives, um, onions, I got some chiles, and, um, you know, some onions and mix that up. I've got fresh cilantro right here, avocado, tomatoes, put it over with some cheese, and then I'm going to get a big bag of lime tostitos, and we're going to go to town eating that. So this is like something that can also be used as a party dish just in case once COVID is over and folks want to have a party let me know i'll send you the recipe uh, <laughs> so this is going to be fun um i also wanted to get back a little bit it's really interesting um pablo how you talk to us about the folks from wisconsin and other places coming in to kind of incite what I don't believe is the Black, the Black Lives Matters movement is not about destruction. And I know this. And so the destruction incited by, there's definitely anger and we definitely understand that anger, but the kind of destruction that sometimes has come from other agitators is something to watch for. Now, your community decided to, you know, we need to protect we need to protect our community. We live here, we breathe here. I mean, I'm here in Albany and I got hit with tear gas here. So I'm just very curious, how did you organize afterwards? What is the intersection that you have with Black Lives Matters? I know you put me in touch with the woman, thank you so much. Um, and we're really looking at Minnesota who has taken police out of schools and who is really urging the movement of defund the police. And we should talk about what does that mean for all of us. So can you talk to us a little more? Well, uh, 
first of all, you know, after the first night of uh, this ugly uh, burning down of uh, parts of Minneapolis, um, the, the community, you know, we all, we, all, we all knew that it wasn't us. We all knew that it wasn't our, our kids, you know, it wasn't our youth, it wasn't our, our neighbors. So what we did, um, and actually uh, a lot of leaders, community leaders that popped up uh, during this crisis, uh, started organizing by neighborhoods. So let's say that, that people gather around in parks and they start naming captains per blocks. And then those captains, you know, they, they, they had the responsibility of create a network uh, through social media and then be in touch with everybody else mm. in that block. So they wouldn't, uh, and then there was some uh, precaution measures that got taken, like, like dumpsters got, got uh, filled with water and they got and they, and, get, and they got you know ready to get water out of them, you know in case of emergency of a fire. So we had dumpsters instead of getting all the uh, flammable materials out of there and and fill them with water. Um, we have folks that, that even block the streets with cars, you know, overnight, and we have people available there you know, twenty four seven. Uh, so they could move the cars and they wouldn't allow anybody that was not part of that block, that street, was not allowed in. So that, that, that really worked out because the, the word spread out. And then so, so the riots uh, uh, didn't spread any, 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 any further than that. Those people were, you know, got, got yeah, they, they put on the boots, you know, and, and got to work on that. And, and to preventive measures, you know, to, uh, to uh, yeah, to, to avoid this situation again for, for another night, so, yeah. What a beautiful example of community taking care of one another. Um, it happens in our communities consistently, and as we're reimagining safety in our communities, this is part of it. I just, my window was smashed the other day, my windshield. I had three neighbors come and knock on the door and I'm going, wow, I, you know, this is amazing. We do take care of one another when, when we need to. <clears throat> um, uh, one so, of these, Charlie, if I, you want to yeah, jump. Yeah, Pablo, I was, I was just wondering, can you, like, what's next? What's on the horizon? Um, you know, are there, are there sort of legislative or governmental solutions that you and your organization are promoting now or or not even through your organization but just in your community what's next well there's there's a, a, a the, at the city level there are still conversations about how to go about creating a, you know there's 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 uh, divisions because there's always interest you know some that do have the real interest of that community are fighting those that have the interests of their own, or their own self-interest, not the people's interest. So one of those uh, is that, the, that in Minneapolis, we would like to have a, a, a citizen, you know, a community, community citizen um, check, you know, a uh, Department of Public Safety within the city that is accountable to the citizen. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of talk about defunding the police, and, and that's, that's, another, uh, that's another way of putting it, to get rid of the police. Uh, one thing I know for sure, that there's not, right now, there's not a lot of support in Minneapolis or anywhere else in the area to keep giving them more money, even though you know, the police union, which are really the uh, real thugs, and I gotta say it, because I know they are. Uh, uh, they're the ones that have been asking more money. And, and I'm gonna say this, but I really like to, uh, for the, uh, for somebody else that is not the federal government to launch an investigation of who's actually sending those people to burn down our cities because I know it has not only happened here in Minneapolis, 
I know the series, but the, some similar has happened. I would like them to, send, uh, to launch an investigation. Who's paying these people to burn down our, our cities? Who's paying? Who's paying those folks that are creating violence? Because right after uh, um, you know these riots, these past two weeks, we have had several shootouts in Minneapolis, especially in the in, in the northern part of Minneapolis, and we have had some uh, some people dying because of shootings. Uh, we have had some in the, in uptown um, Minneapolis too, some shootings, and 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 that's that's so I I find it so suspicious because it, it's been happening uh, like one after the other one, like almost every night, and and I like to know who's paying them, or are they? I don't know, I don't know. There's a lot of interest, you know, at stake. You know, like the police union, they want to keep control of the police departments. Because the police departments, many times we think that the, the mayor and the chief of police have control over them. Well, they only they only have certain power to control the police department. But those that actually have the power is the union. The head of the union has more power than probably the mayor and the chief of police together. So, and, and they are the ones that often, the one that we have here as a chief uh, of the union is been associated to the KKK, to white supremacist groups. So, uh, so he's actually pushing back on all these ideas that, you know, to reform police or actually make a better police. He's actually pushing against it. And so, so I don't know, I'm, you know, you know, there's there's a saying in politics that they said, they said, think 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 the most awful. In politics, always think the most awful, the most awful outcomes, and you might be right. So, I don't know. I I really wish that there could be an investigation, who's been behind all those shootings because it's not have only been one person, randomly. It seems that this has been organized. Yeah. You know, create chaos. So, so I think we 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 still have a long ways to go. But in that process, yeah. uh, we have not stopped marching for George Floyd, for Philando Castillo. We had an event yesterday. Um, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, that was yesterday. We had an event uh, yesterday, uh, remembrance, uh, and 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 there's no stop. I mean. And, yeah. and it should be going. It needs to be going because otherwise, you who who doesn't remember the ninety nine percent movement here? Yeah. Right. What happened yeah. to it? Yeah. Is the, the, some folks I ask and they don't even know what what happened or, or what was that? Because it was just uh, something that was not organized intentionally. Okay. So we. So we to, can't let this die. We yeah. can't let this die. And. To be honest with you, I mean, I looked at the news, af uh, you know, after the uh, long weekend that we had, the 4th of July, and I saw, you know, about six little kids, you know, shot. I just want to say, you know, killed. I, I really, it kind of impacted me and made me think a lot about um, our communities and safety in our communities. Um, and, and people's need to understand a lot in terms of like what we mean by defund the police. It also made me think that Black Lives Matters matters to me no matter what. And, you know, we have George Floyd as the face of this. And then I look at those beautiful children, you know, whose lives were lost and the hope that they carried. I mean, six years old. Um, <laughs> you know, all that, all the kind of violence and the kinds of things that we are seeing now. Um, it really makes me think about, you know, the root causes and why we fight so much at Citizen Action, right? Um, I was looking at some of the chats now, you know, why would somebody, you know, burn down a playground in Binghamton? 
Um, Margaret talking about the unions, you know, that hit it, struck a nerve. We have some of the same issues here in New York, period, um, with the kind of power and control that happens with unions. Um, so when we are talking about defund the police, Charlie, I wanted you to give a little bit of your thoughts about what you think that means at this point. And if folks would like to chime in, what does it mean? Go on the chat, chime in. Let me hear you talk about what you think defund the police actually means. Yeah, that, that would be great if, um, if folks have, have thoughts. Um, I, I mean, I, I think that this is, the, one of the things that's most important to keep in mind that is that um, the idea that, um, you know, there is a um, finite amount of money that can be put into public goods or public services is a myth. And there's plenty of money in the world that can make sure that all of us have the have our needs met. And so um, it's really important to keep in mind that, that the concept of defund the police um, doesn't necessarily need to mean um, that there are no mechanisms for public safety. Uh, it's a reprioritization of, of funding. And on top of that, we can still invest even more into all of the services that are necessary to make sure that um, uh, th that our needs in our communities are met. And so um, we, we don't necessarily need to think of it as, um, as a sort of a give and take one or the other kind of approach. Um, there is plenty of money and there can be money had to be able to put in to uh, all of the services that are necessary to be able to support our communities. And then, you know, in addition to that, the concept of police and policing and a, a violent approach that is rooted in punishment is, um, is violent and evil and needs to be stopped, not because we're spending too much money on it, but because it's violent and evil and needs to be stopped, right? <laughs> and so like the, the idea that, that and all of these problems are very intimately uh, intertwined with economic problems in our communities, right? And the, and the fact that um, wealth is un unbelievably unequal. And, um, what, you know, poverty is, is a pathway to all sorts of community destruction, and there's just no need for it. Um, and so I think it's really important to keep in mind that um, uh, investment is needed, the money is there, we can take the money from the people who've taken it from our communities for so long. Let's take the money back, let's put it where it needs to go, and let's get rid of a violent system that is rooted in, 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 a, in an antiquated and you know, just completely backwards wrong evil concept of punishment that um, doesn't actually help anything, does not make us safer. The, it's, not, it's not about public safety. Um, oh anyway, that's, that's what I'm thinking. Um, From our managing director, wasn't that awesome, folks? Like, absolutely, I totally agree with that. I see a lot of slowly slash the budget where we can reinvest in the community and in schools. We could fully fund schools. I always thought about, I mean, let's think about, you know, when people are released from prisons and re recidivism happens. Part of that is if you really put that on a heat map, you would, on a heat map, you would actually see disinvested communities that have been historically disinvested in. And so there's a part of me that says we can reap, you know, a lot of it is on the economic side. Well, it's been a billions of dollars. You know, Michelle Alexander really talked about that quite well in her book. Um, but all these billions of dollars, we can literally rethink how we're talking and how we're treating human beings. Um, and this is all part of like really defunding the police, really investing in people and in communities that really want to thrive and want that opportunity. Pablo, what do you think about defund the police? What does it mean to you? I think, I think it needs to happen. You know, I read an article about uh, from John Stewart. He said that the, the uh, and he makes a real, real, powerful connection between the police and ICE. He said that the uh, ICE, they keep, uh, you know, separating our families. They want to isolate some communities from, all, from the other community, from the larger community. He said, the police is exactly the same. They're the ICE of North America. 
They yeah. are the border patrol of the communities. They're the ones that make sure that the the blacks and Latinos don't go into the privileged people neighborhood. Because yeah. if they see you there, they kick you out of there. And not only that, but it needs to be defunded because of its uh, real intentions when it was created. You know, the police were not created to, to protect the citizens. You know, their, their original purpose it was to preserve slavery, you know, to oppress uh, people, to control, and, that's, and, and that hasn't changed. They have a sugar coated with the protect and serve but they don't say, they, they put in uh, invisible letters, the rich. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, so, they yeah, they, need, they need to go. They need to go and, and, yeah. and you know, communities were not born with, the, with um, you know, the world did not have a police department when it was created or when it was born. So we, I think we can, it's a big challenge. And I think we can overcome it, you know, just coming together. And like Charlie says, that not having a, a police department or, or a defunded police department does not mean a lack of security. I think yeah. it, it means the opposite. Sure. You should see here when there was the, the, this mess happening here in Minneapolis, people felt safer at the rallies in many of these uh, uh, marches, they felt safer than when the police was present. They felt safer in these neighborhoods that got organized right after the riot. They feel safer in there than going outside and where the police was. They felt safer that they did not even want to call the police. So, so that's the answer. Pablo, I'm seeing a, a, a lot of mentions about, um, you know, d uh, abolishing ICE and, and other immigration related things that I wonder, we didn't actually get to hear too much about the work of um, the Assembly on Civil Rights in Minnesota that you run. And, you yeah. know, what are the campaigns that you tell us about a little bit about your organization and um, the campaigns that you've worked on and been successful on over the years, you know, in addition to the, the, um, your, the story that you told yeah. us at the beginning? Well, you know, uh, we have a uh, we have a common bond with all the other communities that are non Latino. Uh, and what I'm talking about, I'm talking about the, the the black community and the Asian community and other communities that are that that we have been always oppressed uh, by the by the white majority by, by the laws. So. So our, our struggles in, intersect at different levels. Uh, one of those now currently is mass incarceration. And that, that's why police is, 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 a, is, a, is the opening. That's why they have police in the schools. See what's the opening? To start getting uh, our kids ready to send them to prison. It was a pipeline, the entrance to the pipeline. Uh, and immigration is no different. You know, immigration is no different. It's the, the more laws you create, this is why this, this, there's uh, urgency with this current administration to pass more executive orders against immigrants because it criminalizes and then it gives more, more bodies to the prison system. And the more money there is in the prison system, the happier their friends are of these politicians that don't want to change the, the uh, police culture, that always praise the always are praising the the use of force and and the, and the use of weapons in our communities and the militarization of police and and and, the, and ICE, which is well, I mean we we fight in a big fight, you know. Uh, I mean we've been organizing for for. Um, I, I want to walk away from immigration reform. Yeah, I, I'm, I have a conflict talking about immigration reform, although that's the least thing that we can get. But the, the reason I, I'm, I don't feel comfortable talking about immigration reform is because every, every, if you go to, the, to a right, right wing minded person, they have their own definition of immigration reform. And it is not good for us. That's for sure. I guarantee you that. So, so, so 
and I'm I'm not comfortable with the word because it came from from politicians in DC. It did not came from that community. Right. So, but we've been fighting for citizenship, immediate yeah. citizenship for our community. Uh, the other thing is um, the term legalization we always use that term legalization but we always imply there's an illegality right. when we use legalization so i, I kind of like to you know <laughs> so i always have those struggles because words are powerful yeah those are powerful i mean, I mean that, yeah i but, always think about you know the fact that you know Mexicans in particular were native to this land, to this country, right? Like you were native there. And then you have to go in front of a judge, uh, you know, white man who came in here, who's telling you that you're illegal here. Um, after it was all stolen in many, many ways, it, it's just the irony, it just kills me. The other thing that I wanted to mention is, uh, yesterday Sam and Ravi did a wonderful job in talking about dominant narratives. Yep. And there's a dominant narrative that is continuing to echo in this country, particularly because of COVID. Um, and if you think about it, I, I, like I've been doing a little thinking about it and I'm thinking about, wow, immigration, uh, you know, the reforms and immigration that are needed for citizenship are gonna become even harder simply because there's this narrative that our president, not my president, uh, that the president is spewing out of the White House and blaming everything on we, you know, why we need to close the borders is to keep us safe from things like the COVID and so on and so forth. And it catches on. So I want to be vigilant. While there has been a bit of the COVID that has exposed us to getting further ahead, particularly in the narrative around healthcare. I think we're going backwards in terms of immigration reform. And when you think about the police, I think about how many times, who do they use to bust down our doors in order to get to figure out if you're a citizen of the United States? It's the police, it's the people that take our children and put them in cages as well. So police to me is, the one big, the demilitarization, you said it quite well, the demilitarization of this is partly at the epicenter of being able to really figure out how to move in this country. So um, I think we should take a little break and Pablo, tell us where you are in your cooking. I'm basically done. And let me actually just interrupt one uh, quickly and just say anybody who's on um, watching on Facebook Live, feel free to um, put any questions you have in the comments and, and uh, Ravi's monitoring that and can um, jump in in a minute and ask them. And if anybody else has any questions, especially questions for Pablo about his workout in Minnesota, um, feel free to put them in the, in the chat or on Facebook Live in the comments. That'd be great. Uh, so no, Pablo, no. Where, where are you at when you're cooking there? Well, um, I'm, I'm, I'm just getting ready my tortillas for my salsa, I got some quesadillas. That, uh, that we get to put the salsa on, and I got some cactus. I got some uh, roasted cow cactus on the on the, on the pan. Ooh, roasted cactus. Yeah, like a. Oh, that is palace. awesome. It's called tender cactus, but it, it's not the saguaro cactus. Okay, this is a different. This is my okay. palace. Okay. okay. Oh, it's delicious. Mm. Oh, I can imagine. I could imagine. I've had your food, Pablo. I've had your food. <laughs> um, Charlie, where are you at with yours? Um, I finished my salsa and my slaw. And so here's the salsa all set. Awesome. Some tomatoes and such. And then I just did the, uh, the Napa cabbage with some bell pepper. And I use a little bit of... Uh, Greek yogurt mm. and the seasoning I mixed up. So I'm about to cook the fish. Awesome. So Vicky, if you, I know you were cooking over there at home, I wonder if you could let us know if anyone else is cooking, let us know where you're at. I've actually finished. This was a very easy to prepare dish. Uh, unlike the past two that I did. 
folks remember, I did the chicken and biscuits and pernil and arroz con gandules and all that kind of stuff. So, this is what it looks like. It really looks awesome and yummy. It's got um, sour cream and cream cheese on the bottom with the mixture of the hamburger meat with some cilantro, fresh cilantro, tomatoes, onions, black olives. And then what you do is you take, so I've never made this before. So now it's like test time. Actually, I've got a better idea. Our movement politics director just came to my house to get some. I want a guinea pig. Can I have come up and tell me how it tastes? This would be awesome. Come on, Joey. Let everybody see you. Hi. <laughs> so dig in all the way deep. Okay. So you can get some of the salsa. Right on the chair. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, and oh. see what that tastes like. Mm. It's good. It's good. I hey, I got an A-OK, -okay, everybody. This is awesome. <laughs> so, nice. Uh, Success. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. Hey, uh, Ravi, just feel free to jump in if anything's coming through on Facebook. That um, we have a question for... from John Furman. How can we build a movement that helps people connect the dots among racism, capitalism, and oppression? Can you repeat? How can we build a movement that helps people connect the dots between racism, capitalism, and oppression? That is a great cool. one. Yeah. So, Charlie, Pablo? Oh, I, I defer to Pablo on this one. Pablo, let's defer okay. to you. Well, you know, first, first of all, we need to have, uh, we need to get to know each other. Until we don't know each other's own history, we will not be able to connect the dots. Because, uh, um, you know, there's a saying that they say that there's not such a bad person, that there's only ignorant person. And, uh, and I, th I believe that if the, the only way we can connect the dots is what I what I, when I find out that I, what affects you affects me, I'm gonna be there all the way 100%. But when, I, when my, my neighbor don't know what, I, the, what happens to me affects them, he's not gonna care anything about me. He's not gonna give a squat. So that's why we need to have conversations, conversations, conversations. And, and that's the only way that we can connect the dots. And, and be proactive, you know, uh, I mean, not reactive. It's always, uh, it's always good to react, you know, to uh, events like what happened to our brother, uh, George Floyd, uh, and, and go out in the streets and take over the streets. But, uh, we got to keep connecting those dots by building relationships among ourselves. And that's how we connect the dots. Thank you, Pablo. I think um, I want to expand on that. Like, I really believe in relationship building. Um, I always think of myself as a collector of relationships, as my hobby is to collect relationships. But I think it's also we really need to think about what are the structural reforms that we need to make happen in our country and in our cities and in our states. So as I think about capitalism, I think about white supremacy um, and they go hand in hand. This is what Sam and Ravi and all of us have been really drilling to, the, to as many people as possible is that duality of the rate, what I call capitalized racism, but racial capitalism is, is what we term it. And how that goes hand in hand in order to continue to divide and oppress. So what do we need to do about it? I think that we have plenty of ideas. Movements are part of that. Policy is another part of that. Building relationships is another part of that. I think that we're in a moment now that we're seeing different kinds of things happening very differently. Like it's not a completely unified, all walk together thing. There's different ideas, similar to what happened during the civil rights mo movement, right? If you think about the children's march and when that happened, how there were uh, very different, um, you know, 
peaks of escalation that needed to happen. And then you think about the divisions that also happen in there, but the cumulative effect was the tipping point to really move civil rights at that time. And we're still fighting that. So as we escalate, I'm also thinking about what are the direct actions? Who is responsible for these things? How do we ensure that we don't, um, that we pull the curtain back on the elite, the, those that continue to use, you know, like Oz, I always think of some Wizard of Oz behind some curtain that has surrounded themselves with military and with all kinds and, and money and politics in order to control. So if we pull the and show the villain behind the curtains, in order for people to really truly understand that and to really say, no, we're not going to let that happen. We're going to politicize our movement. We're going to get people out who are not necessarily thinking about our population, then I think all of those things are combined in a, and we as citizen action have a big role to play in that. It's not the only role. We're not gonna be the end all be all that stops capitalism and racism and you know white supremacy, but combined with everything else that people are doing, we have an incredibly important role and all of that has value in ending this. And I'll just um, uh, bookend that, and it, I think it kind of speaks to, Dan offered a, a question in the chat, um, what are the most important things for white allies to do? And while, while I'm not going to answer that question explicitly, I'd love to get Pablo and Rosemary's yeah. thoughts on that. I, I will just say that, you know, speaking to that effect, the it's really important when we're looking at, um, at, at the, the power that elected officials have in uh, in being the leaders within our government, that they that we look at people who are willing to acknowledge that um, integration between capitalism and racism and the oppressive forces that exist within both of those. And po politicians and candidates who we support need to be willing to look at solutions that attack this as a unified problem, right? And so politicians, you know, I, I think about um, our governor here in New York, Andrew Cuomo, he's you know, all, all willing to talk about the challenges of racism and then turns around and um, is completely unwilling to tax any of the rich people in the state, mainly because they're all his campaign contributors, um, tax those folks to be able to actually provide the investment that's necessary to uh, support the communities all across the state. So, you know, you can't have one or the other um, it's not actually going to work for for any of our governmental leaders to um, to be fighting either just racism or just capitalism because neither of those things exist in isolation of the other. And so I, I think we need to be really looking at the candidates who we're supporting and their um, realization of uh, of the actual um, scope of the oppressive system that that we're all uh, living in right now. So I want to just say thank you, Samantha. Make billionaires pay. And I want to give a shout out to Dan Roller, who's out in Chicago, is a friend of mine. Uh, he's asking, what are the most important things for white allies to do? I would say, Dan, number one, this is the kind of support that you've always given to communities and that you have like really leaned into discomfort in order to understand your place is absolutely a model of what white allies can do. I think even the Latino community, I'm a light-skinned Puerto Rican girl, we have a lot of work to do in terms of colorism and everything else. So part of it is not staying silent any longer at those dinner tables when you know food and politics just don't mix anymore. It's really about you know creating enough tension to confront the actual um, problem that are that is affecting not just blacks and Latinos, right? It is affecting everyone. Even white folks do better through the end of racism. It actually does that. Um, and so I, it's it's because of all of us. 
So we've got four minutes left. I want to let Charlie and Pablo wrap it up because my thing is really good. Oh my God. <laughs> so I'm taking a bite. Pablo, how's your cooking going? Oh, I got my salsa rayada right here. I already grated it. I don't know if nice. It's, here. it's very, very hot and spicy. Cool. Cool. Just ready Pablo, show, show everybody what's on your uh, apron. Oh, my. This is my, uh, this is our uh, logo and, and citizenship now. Awesome. No more waiting. Uh, no more waiting. A dream for all. Cool. Yeah. That's our Great. campaign. A dream for all. Yeah, all right. Well, um, my, uh, my fish is here. I got a nice piece of haddock that I'm cooking. It's, it's cooking up. I seasoned it, but trying mm -hmm. to show you. So, cool. um, I trained you. <laughs> so that, that's cooking. And, um, yeah, so I, I, this has been a, a fantastic um, uh, evening and discussion. I think it's one of the most um, most real and substantive conversations we've had yet. Um, we keep getting better each time. Um, yeah. And so um, thank you all so much, everybody, for joining us tonight. Um, uh, I do want to, Rosemary, were you going to talk about the other events coming up this week? Oh, yeah. So I also don't want you all to forget on Thursday we have um, Karen Scharf, Sochi, who is the executive director of the Working Families Party, and perhaps even a few legislators on a panel talking to us about how we create that political power that we were just talking about. Um, and uh, that's going to be an amazing conversation, especially since Citizen Action is one of the, um, we uh, are part of the Working Families Party and a member of the Working Families Party. We, we are the Working Families Party. And on Saturday, you don't want to miss that, Dr. Tony Lewis, who is the board chair of the Public Policy and Education Fund, will be our keynote. Um, we're going to have some conversation. And this, remember every two years, and if you don't know, thank, uh, let me explain to you, every two years, um, we have a leadership summit where we actually elect through a democratic process our, our state uh, at large state representatives from across the state from Buffalo to New York City. Um, you must be a member in order to uh, actually vote a dues paying member for a certain amount of time. But we're going to go through that process so that you meet the representatives who want to represent you in citizen action, because the direction we go in is based on folks who are on this you know, Aviva, John Furman, Margaret Segal, Ruth Lee, many of them who have decided this is their organization and we are there to support the direction of the folks. This is what makes us a real grassroots organization because it is the grassroots who sit on our state boards and lead the organization. So that's- right. And that's okay. so Ravi, are you able to throw the, um, the registration link into the chat? Yep, I will put that registration link. Cool. In. So, and so, just a reminder, everybody um, who, if you want to attend for Thursday night or for Saturday, um, you register for each of those events individually on the page that uh, will show up in the chat window um, in just a moment. Pablo, ha sido un placer, mi amor. Te quiero tanto. I love you, Pablo. Sigue por la lucha. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you, Pablo. It was great Bye. to discuss with you. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Have a great night, everybody. See you soon.